Amazing. Oh, that's it. Now, okay, that's a sign. All right, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say thank you all for uh, for being part of this discussion. Thank you for the participants. Thank you for the audience. Big hugs to you all, and uh, I go to bed. And I will listen to this discussion tomorrow, all right? Sorry, it's 4.40 for me, 4 a.m. in the morning, so I am done with this day. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks so much, Clement. Um, so um, Clement's the filmmaker um, of that wonderful film, The Condor and the Eagle, um, who most of you who are tuning in will have just watched the film, um, but we're also going live on the Seed Indigenous Youth Climate Network Facebook page. And so we may have other supporters joining us who haven't seen the film. Um, but just to give you all a brief insight into what we're going to be talking about over the next um, roughly sort of hour um, is, um, you know, connected um, between the Environmental Film Festival, um, the Seed Indigenous Youth Climate Network and amazing First Nations Indigenous people from across the Turtle, Turtle Island, um, North America, Central America, South America. Um, there's so many connections that we have and, you know, we as Indigenous people um, are, you know, not only amongst the most strong and resilient people in the world, but we have been facing some in incredible challenges um, and, you know, really, really heartbreaking challenges that I think we've seen come up not only in that film but we know because we're experiencing them right now today. Um, you know this is the ongoing impacts of colonization here in Australia um, but I know that we have people tuning in from all around the world and wherever we are you know we talk about being on Aboriginal land or First Nations Indigenous land um, that you know, in, in most cases has been stolen and our people are and have been fighting for so long. And so we're going to be discussing, you know, our reflections on this film, but also talking a bit about, you know, what's going on right now and what can we do and how can we as First Nations Indigenous people join together in this collective struggle um, for our collective, um, I guess, fight for freedom and liberation and healing. So I'm really, really um, privileged because I feel like this is really special to be um, doing this panel in this way. Um, so thank you all so much for joining in. Um, just really briefly, my name's Millie Telford. I'm a, a proud Bundjalung and South Sea Islander woman and the, have the privilege of being the National Director of the SEED Indigenous Youth Climate Network. Um, I'm gonna hand over to our panelists to just um, briefly introduce themselves um, before we get into sharing our reflections on the film. So um, firstly, I will throw to Tish, um, who has been an incredible volunteer um, on the film festival and also is on our team at SEED. Over to you, sis. Thanks, Sissy. Oh, wow, incredible. So happy to be here as well. Uh, so for everyone that is joining us, my name is Tishiko King and I am a proud Torres Strait Islander woman with strong connections to Musig and Badu Island. I too would like to acknowledge country knowing that we are tuning from all different places and where I am, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people and the surrounding clans of the Kulin Nation. I would like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. I'd also like to acknowledge um, every Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person that is joining us today here on Zoom and any First Nations people across the world um, that do identify as Indigenous to their community and people of colour watching. As Millie said, I am the organising coordinator here at SEED, Indigenous Youth Climate Network, and we have been building a movement of young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to protect their land, rivers and oceans from the causes and impacts of climate change. Caring for country is important to me because as a proud Torres Strait Islander, our islands and our oceans um, are who we are, the way of life and our language. We are so connected to our island spiritually and that is um, that when country is hurting, we are hurting. So we are at a crucial moment in our lives right now and the way we are occupying this planet is just not working anymore and we need to stand together and we need to be a part. No, scrap that, not be a part. We need to lead this movement because social justice is climate justice. And if not for us, then for our future generations. Thanks, Millie. Thanks so much, Tish. Um, Tiani, over to you, sis. 
Hey mob, my name's Tiani. I'm an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander woman with connections to Thursday Island in the Torres Strait on my dad's side and just found out on my mum's side we've got connections to APY lands in South Australia so that's really exciting to connect in with more mob and find more family. Um, yeah, amazing. So I'm a student at the University of Adelaide. I'm studying a Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Conservation Biology. I just had my last exam yesterday. Um, I also work in fisheries compliance um, for PERSA and I'm the state coordinator of seed mob down here on Ghana land. So I'm actually on Ghana country right now in Adelaide and I'd like to pay my respects to the Ghana people uh, we have such beautiful country here and I'm really grateful to be able to learn and reside on this country. I'd also like to shout out to all other mob, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, all other um, First Nations mob as well, and give you all the biggest hug, pay respects to our ancestry and the beautiful connection that we have with this land and place and that we have with each other. Thanks so much for jumping online. I'm really excited. Thanks so much, sis. And just to share with everyone that's tuning in right now, we, um, everyone on this panel, um, you know, just got together before we went live and um, had a very quick chance to get to know one another. But we were saying how amazing it would be to be able to be face to face and give one another a hug and share a meal um, or a coffee or, you know, a tea or something like that. But yeah, we, we make do with what we've got right now, especially in our current circumstances. So um, over to you, um, Judith, we'd love for you to introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. That was powerful. Thank you so much for sharing, Tish and Tiani. Uh, Amelia, thank you for hosting this and, you know, holding all of this and everything that's happening. I um, feel really honored to be here with you all, especially all the work, learning about the work that y'all are doing down in Australia, down under, as they say. I have never been there. Um, and I wish that, you know, after all of this, we can share a meal or coffee or something. That would be really great. Uh, my name is Judith Nieto. Uh, mi nombre es Judith Nieto, and I am originally from Reynosa, Tamaulipas, Mexico. I am a child of immigrant parents, uh, Afro-Mexicana uh, on the side of my father, and I am still learning my lineage and my 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 roots. Uh, we are indigenous to uh, Turtle Island. Uh, we are part of. Uh, regions of the Chichimecas, the Totomi, and even the Huicholes. But I don't know exactly where I come from because we are melted into this beautiful part of mestizaje, um, mixed mixed race. Uh, so I'm, I'm still learning and I'm very proud to be a child of immigrant parents. I'm a language justice worker uh, as well. I grew up interpreting and translating for my parents uh, as an immigrant child and learning the colonized language of English and speaking the colonized language of Spanish. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out what other languages we spoke besides Nahual, which is an indigenous language to Mexico. And I'm really happy to be here. I, I just can't say just how amazed I am by all of your energy, all of your efforts, and all of the things that you all bring to, to the world that we are living in right now. I am also a cultural organizer. I'm an artist. And so that's my tool, my tools to be able to build movement with youth, with young people, with um, or building an intergenerational movement, you know, working and learning from our elders and continuing the legacies of work uh, towards environmental justice and now climate justice uh, and all of the other justices that we need to win, you know, gender justice, economic justice. Uh, trans and queer justice and all of the other things that we need to build these platforms on. So thank you all for hosting this again. Thank you all for your hard work. I'm amazed. Please don't ever stop. And I, I look forward to meeting you all in person at some point. Thank you so much, sis. It, um, yeah, it makes me emotional just even thinking about how connected our struggles are and hearing you talk about still learning, you know, so many, that's a shared story for so many of us, right? Um, whether it's from 
um, colonization and dispossession, you know, being forced to move off country, being forced to not speak our native um, or indigenous languages, um, you know, being, um, yeah, being uh, treated unfairly because of who we are and our identity and our connection to our country. Um, I just wanted to, yeah, thank you for sharing that insight and, and you know, I guess echo that that is a shared struggle and a shared story. Um, Kwana, over to you. And I have no idea what time it is where you're calling in from, both of you. So thank you so much, because it might be a horrible time of the night. <laughs> oh, no, it's actually really early where I'm at. And the sun stays up like 24 seven here in Alaska. So it's nice. Um, I'm Kwana Chasing Horse Potts. Um, I am Han Guichin in Lakota Sioux. Um, my mom is from Eagle Village here in Alaska, and um, my dad is from the Rosebud Reservation. Um, I am 18 years old now, and I am currently living in Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, I am a part of the Gwich'in Youth Council. I am the head chair of the Gwich'in Youth Council, so um, I have had amazing opportunities um, within the activism work I do. Um, I love the word activist, but I prefer to be called a protector of my way of life, my lands and my people. Um, as a youth, my goal mainly is to uplift younger youth because um, starting this work, I always felt like my, vo my voice was not valued, especially being a woman of color and um, having my own opinion and being outspoken about that. Um, but I just want, um, you know, all the other youth out there to know that um, we have a lot of people to back you up and we have um, amazing people out there that understand and know where you're coming from, especially um, with those who are dealing with a lot of these struggles too, that feel the anxiety we all feel when it comes to these environmental crises and even with the Black Lives Matter movements right now that's been on heavy on my heart lately um and with this film i think it opens up a lot of eyes to not only our um different pe like it opens to many different perspectives of how our environment has been struggling a lot especially within the oil industry and how our people you know indigenous people have been greatly affected by that and not just indigenous people people of color um people everywhere and so thank you for helping uplift my voice. And I'm very grateful to hear your guys' amazing words and learning from you as well and your experiences. Thank you so much for having me. So great to have you, sis. And um, I know you just shared with us earlier that you just turned 18 and can vote. And what a you know powerful time to be voting over there um, and here. You know, there's um, we're just months away from a, an election up in the Northern Territory, and you know, talking to our mob about the power of, of even just one vote, where we've seen um, you know a, an Aboriginal man, an independent. Um, politician get voted in just on eight votes um and so every vote does count you know um but yeah just wanted to share that happy birthday <laughs> um <Thank you. laughs> so um I think it, it's really fitting that we have a panel of incredibly staunch First Nations women um because you know for those who watch the film towards the end it talks about the um you know the treaty that was shared amongst um Indigenous women from throughout um Turtle Island and I think that you know as Melina um, talked about, it's the the way our Mother Earth is treated um, is a reflection of the way our women are treated. And the number of missing and murdered Indigenous women in Canada and in you know across the US and other parts of the world, like we, you know, we see that in different ways here. Um, but these struggles are so connected. And something that we, you know, I guess like when you look and you you draw back the root causes of these issues, it's the colonial system. Um, it's 
um, capitalism, oh, we just lost Tish, I'm sure she'll be back. Um, it's patriarchy and the way different people's lives are treated less or more than others. And I think, you know, when it comes to our mother earth, it's the, it's the systems that lead people to think that we can keep taking and taking without giving back and, um, you know, expecting that our mother will just continue to provide. And, and we know, we know as Indigenous people that that's not the case, that goes deeply against our values um, and the, the systems that we've had that have enabled us to look after our land sustainably for tens of thousands of years and generations. Um, so, Judith, I'm going to pass to you to um, talk a little bit more about the film um, that many people tuning in will have just watched, but we also do have some people tuning in who may not have seen it. So we'd love for you to just, yeah, share your reflections in connection to the film, but just to give a little bit of that background for those who may not have seen it as well. Yeah, um, sure. I mean, the film, the film was a big journey uh, for me, you know, awakening to um, the world as it was changing. Um, it wasn't done in the course of three to four years, maybe even longer. I, I honestly time, I don't even know how long it took. I was doing organizing work in my community of Manchester, which um, if you saw the film is a small community, uh, predominantly Mexican American and documented immigrant families, and we're completely surrounded by industrial development, uh, refineries, chemical industries, um, and even recycling, a recycling company, um, and the biggest, the busiest highway in Houston. So, you know, we, we get a lot of issues from air contamination to soil, even acid rain, um, explosions and uh, all kinds of leaks and, and gas, uh, gas leaks and explosions. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty dire to live in, in a community like that, but it's one of the most affordable places to live, especially for an undocumented immigrant family coming to the US. And that was sort of the story of my family. Uh, we're immigrants and you know that's where we found was um, small and tight knit. Uh, the community is beautiful in the sense that the people there are beautiful and, and connected, but it's a horrible place to live because it's completely surrounded by these industries and contamination. Um, so this journey was about me growing into myself and, and seeing how we're completely and, and connected to a lot of people outside of our world, you know, outside of the US and the exploitation that happens. I traveled to Alberta, Canada to uh, be part of the healing walk there where we walked the corridor of the tar sands um, extractive extraction sites. And, you know, that helped me understand how far and how drastic these, um, these horrible, contaminants were in our community and and it gave me the anger and the courage to be able to speak in front of city council um in front of uh our our civic uh community organization you know where i'm trying to get people to do more and to wake up and mobilize it was a hard journey you know it was a lot of heartbreak um but also it was beautiful in connection. I connected with a lot of youth, um, the Yasuni, those which you met in the film, uh, who were protecting the Yasuni, which is one of the most biodiverse parks and regions in the Amazon, even more biodiverse than the Galapagos Island. And I met some amazing, beautiful people there working with um, um, Acción Ecológica, which is an organization that helps to um, educate the indigenous people on the the contaminants found in the things that they use in everyday um, things, you know, like even the things that they were using to collect water. These are people that live very naturally, you know, that live in harmony with their environments. And they didn't know that these barrels that they were cleaning out to collect water were still contaminating their water and making them sick. Uh, so it was really heartbreaking to, um, to hear the stories of the indigenous people that um, 
that were using these things to collect their water and then six months down the road they were dying of unknown cancers and drastic crazy um ailments that they'd never experienced before uh and 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 brian my colleague who is also in the film who i still work with you know he was able to to see the uh the amazon be destroyed by these companies that have offices and have headquarters in houston texas where you know where we live and that was a uh, a platform that that helped us be in solidarity with the indigenous people in in the amazon and, and south america that uh could connect in a different way you know we uh we organized and participated in civil disobedience actions and direct actions where we helped to amplify their messages uh, of accountability to these companies. And yeah, this, this film, it was beautiful and also, you know, had to be cut down to an hour and a half and it didn't show the complete story of all of our experiences you know melina's experience was also very powerful in the way that she was able to go back in time almost um to a place where still lived very um very natural and and her culture and and her tribal nation had you know kind of lost a lot of that because of the tar sands exploitation and you know it was just it was just a very powerful learning experience for me as an organizer um as an activist which i like when i don't i don't like to be called an activist because i didn't just get activated you know i i, I think we'd always had this in our DNA to be fighters and, and to continue to, to thrive in the environments where we had to adapt. Um, when you're an immigrant kid, you know, you kind of have to be very quick to either assimilate or adapt and, and then also relearn and unlearn some things. So I'm still on that journey. I think this film is just kind of touching the surface um, and it helped me to create um, connections and networks of solidarity that are going to uh, follow me throughout my life. You know, this is a life's work. It's not just the a thing that you do because you're bored or because you just feel like doing it. It's it's a calling, you know, to your spirit and, and to the rest of your life. It's something that you have to be committed to and, and responsible for, you know, and so it, it was it was very moving for me. Um, and if you haven't seen the film, I urge you to look at to, to watch it, um, to check it out. We have the international premiere on July 1st. It'll be in Spanish because we are having um, indigenous women from the Amazon uh, on board and they'll be speaking in Spanish and it will be interpreted into English um, if you need if you need to understand the whole thing in the discussion, but um, check it out. It's not the only time that you can see it. You know, you did not miss anything. Uh, this is an ongoing story and it's not just my story. This is not special in, in, in this way. I think that we all have this story. Um, they just happened to capture it. <laughs> you know, and Clement and Sophie did an amazing job at working on this and, and um, putting this, the pieces together in a beautiful way. Thank you so much, Sis. Um, that, yeah, really, really resonates. I know that we often talk about as Aboriginal people, we're born political and, you know, we don't have a choice more often than not to be active. And it's a part of our, our uh, bloodline, our history, our, you know, cultural responsibility to look after the land and look after one another, um, you know, which is very different to non-Indigenous people who can choose at times whether or not to be a part of these struggles. And as many times it was addressed in the film, like if you breathe clean air, like if you need clean air to breathe and you need water, this is your fight. This is not just a fight of Indigenous people or people of colour. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. I'm going to hand to you, Kwana, um, to hear your thoughts or reflections and, and connections to the film as well. Yes, um, that film, just watching it twice now, um, every time it really hits, it hits every time and it never fails to really catch my attention because it's something I'm passionate about and seeing how this movement isn't just where I'm at it's 
everywhere, um, especially within our indigenous communities, within our people of color communities. And, um, you know, I can relate to it in many different ways. Um, I've been fighting here with my Gwich'in Youth Council that I'm the head chair of. Um, I've been fighting really hard to protect our sacred lands from oil and gas drilling here. And I went to DC to, um, to lobby, I guess, <laughs> lobby, <laughs> um, to pretty much just share my story and educate people on, you know, why it's so important to us, why we need the environment and our lands and our waters protected and how, you know, our future generations, we hardly have anything left. They take more and more and more and they keep taking. And, you know, I want my grandchildren, I want my kids to be able to go out on the land and have the same experiences I have had growing up as a kid. You know, I grew up my ways of life pretty strong. Um, I've been all over the world, even just um, absorbing other cultures as well. Um, so, you know, just being so aware of, you know, not only is it a problem here, but it's a problem in other places. A lot of other people feel my pain. And I have to remind myself, like, this is a world, this is a fight that, you know, people all over the world are fighting too, that I don't have to carry all of it. And I feel really, um, you know, with this film, when I first watched it, I really was in tears because, you know, seeing how people came together so strongly with this message, you know, um, you know, saying that we don't need this. We can't, we can't keep harming our earth. We can't keep harming you know, what's keeping us alive, um, you know, especially with, you know, our indigenous peoples and our women, you know, what happens, you know, it's like a re huge reflection on what happens to the earth is what happens to our women. And, you know, being a young indigenous woman, and I'm still trying to figure out things on my own, I just turned 18. I'm kind of scared to go out on my own because of anything that could happen to me it's scary for me to think about. And also um, uh, just how I've been fighting so hard for so long for, for our lands and my people and my future generations, you know, you know, all the people in power that can change that, that can make it easier for us don't. And that's why we have to fight so hard. It's, um, it's a constant thought in my head, like, you know, I don't want my grandchildren to have to deal with this. Like we as young people are the ones that are gonna have to deal with the aftermath of what these people in power, these decisions, you know, that they're making, we're gonna have to be the ones to deal with it and clean up their mess. And I don't want to have to look at my grandchildren and, you know, see that they're, they're fighting for our way of life still. I wanna be able to, you know, let them go out on the land and not worry about, you know, like oil or, you know, finding, you know, um, animals that are dying because of climate change or, you know, all of our issues here and I, and all the trauma within our people and our lands, you know, without um, all of the justice that we deserve and that we need for the land, for the people, um, it's going to be really hard for us to heal and to break these cycles of trauma and you know within our people there's a lot of um let's say violence and you know abuse it's because of our people have been suffering for way too long and we have this huge weight in our chest and as a young person to really see that and feel that i want the future generations to not have to carry so much of that either and um, being a young person and you know having my voice heard is something I feel very privileged and honored to have these experiences and these opportunities because I feel like I can um, get the message across to young people like you know I've had a lot of younger girls tell me thank you you have given like shown me that I can use my voice that I have found my voice and that's my big goal is to make sure that ind young indigenous women feel comfortable using their voice. And um, 
all people of color, all beautiful people of color to be able to express their experiences and how they've been dealing with um, these crises. So as a young person, I, um, I really have a lot of passion for all of these issues and seeing and talking with elders and older people and learning from their experiences is a much more privilege to me than here having my voice heard because, you know, they've been through it as well. They've seen it a lot more than I have. And um, just being able to listen and understand each other and meet people and talk to them. It's, it's one thing that I'm learning, but I'm growing as well. So thank you for having me i'm learning and growing every step of the way and every time i watch this film i learn something new it's like a constant reminder you learn something new and it's like wow these people are amazing so thank you and um i just want to let you guys know that um being so young and looking up to you guys is you know hard workers like it's something i strive to continue so thank you for adding to my long list of amazing people in my life. Oh, Kwana, you're too deadly, which is a term that we use here. Um, deadly, like it might not make sense in other contexts because you're like, what? We you use it here too. We <laughs> <laughs> use <a> <laughs> on the <laughs> res too. <laughs> you're like, it's like cool, awesome, mean, you know, yeah, deadly. <laughs> um, look, to all our supporters and um, audience who are tuning in, I just want to remind everyone that in a few minutes we'll be opening to questions. So if you are tuning in via Zoom um, or the webinar platform or watching us on Facebook, uh, we've got some people who are keeping an eye on the comments and questions coming through. So if you've got any questions for our panelists, please um, post them or send them through with love to hear um because we're yeah gonna get into a yarn or a discussion um in a moment so i'm gonna throw to you tiani um would love to hear your thoughts and reflections on the film thanks sis thanks so much um beautiful sissies for you know speaking your truth and being a vessel of truth i think i resonate so strongly when you say that it's um it's like a cultural and moral obligation as um, citizens of this earth, of people who reside here to do this, this work. It's something that must be done. And I know that it's um, relentless and takes a lot of energy, but it's so wonderful to be a part of this and to connect in and see the linearity across the globe of what's happening and to find strength in that. I think that often, um, sometimes, especially with things related to climate justice, when we look at the enormity of it, it becomes really huge and really scary. And I think that's obviously one of the problems that we have when we convey this science and this, this truth to other people is that it does become really big and a lot to swallow. And often, you know, people want to put their heads in the sand or ignore it and pretend that it doesn't exist. And so being able to have this information conveyed in amazing ways like this film and to seek strength in other Indigenous women all over the globe and Indigenous men, of course, too, um, is really inspiring. And I think that's what was highlighted so strongly in the film for me. Here in Australia, we have a lot of um, parallel issues to the types of things happening. We have uh, attempts to frack the Northern Territory, which uh, the Northern Territory is all connected by one water table. So fracking in the NT is extremely, it's just a ridiculous thought to have really because obviously Water is Life and Seed actually have a film called Water is Life that's quite similar to the documentary we just watched. So definitely jump on that, um, you mob as well. Just look up Water is Life Seed and you'll be able to watch that one. It's a little short film discussing our issues here in, in Oz in the NT. Um, but obviously our mob who are relying on water for as obviously a water source to depend like for animals and for flora that rely on the water. Everything's all interrelated and the health of all that exists relies on the health of our water. So fracking in the NT here is extremely dangerous and it's something that SEED have been running a campaign on um, for quite a long time. We also have an open cut mine looking to happen in Gomeroy country, which um, is a sacred site of our indigenous mob here in Australia. 
Um, just recently, hopefully a lot of people have heard that Rio Tinto blew up a 46,000 uh, 46, year old cultural site um, and that's in the Pilbara region and that was for iron ore. So that was really devastating to our mob in Western Australia. And another example of, I guess, you know, the media are starting to highlight a bit more Indigenous voices in climate justice and climate justice. And even though our voices are becoming a bit louder, companies like this are still able to, I guess, put on earmuffs and not listen to us and continue this destruction. So it just shows the need to continue to educate and push and make these changes. Um, here in South Australian soil on Anyamatna country, we have underground coal gasification uh, happening around the Lee Creek region, which is obviously, again, awful for our communities. It dispossesses our mob of their land, has huge impacts onto how we can survive for hunting, um, fishing and gathering of different materials, as well as obviously just destruction of cultural sites and burial sites in general. So the list goes on and on and on about these things happening in Australian soil. And I just wanted to sort of take the opportunity to, to discuss a few of the big ones. We also have at the bottom of Australia, the great Australian bite that goes in this beautiful bite shape like this um, and company after company continually jumping in, trying to drill for oil um, on this amazing um, sea country, which is a biodiversity hotspot for lots of our marine systems and whales. And it's also super rough out there. Um, I've actually sailed through that region of that coastline and it's not stable at all. So the thought of um, drilling in that region is devastating because it's so rough and so rocky and so incredible that the likelihood of a spill in that area is extremely high. So yeah, just wanted to let those things out there. Um, and also just, yeah, thank you so much again for your strength in that film, you, you are incredible. And also to the producers of the film for putting that forward. And I'm not sure how we're going for time, so I'll palm you back to Millie. <laughs> yeah, just encouraging everyone to send through any questions that you have via Zoom or on Facebook. Um, but we, before we go into questions, I'm going to throw to you, Tish, um, for your reflections on this film. You know, that was um, the third time I actually watched it. And, you know, it, like Kwana just said, you know, I just, I just seeing communities come together uh, and really embracing, um, you know, and showing and illustrating the strength of unity. I just get so emotional uh, to see that because, you know, in light of everything that happens and what the, how this affects and impacts our communities, you know, together, you know, we can we can be whole together. We can, you know, really, I guess, you know, be there and you know show strength through that unity. It's yeah, it's really something special. And I think you know when the opening of the film, you know, actually says that when the eagle of the north and the condor of the south fly together, Indigenous people will unite the human family. Honestly, like that just brings shivers down my spine. And I, I think, you know, just right here and having these conversations and standing next to, you know, staunch sissies from across this, you know, our, our you know, across, you know, different First Nations, I think is an illustration of, you know, what we're starting and, you know, being a part of this, you know, international movement of, of like showing strength and elevating these voices because, you know, for such a long time, mainstream media, you know, even still, you know, don't illustrate those, uh, you know, fossil fuel companies and those detrimental impacts on our communities. Uh, you know, it's just, and this, and the time is now to do this, you know, and if not us, then who, and if not now, then when, you know, and, you know, we sort of say that in seed a lot and, you know, standing together in solidarity is something the way that we're really going to achieve this. Um, so I always feel a little bit empowered, you know, that little bit more every time I watch that film because it really illustrates, you know, the, the, the struggles of that. I guess mirroring what you've all said, you know, the, you know our, our country is our bloodline. It's who we are. And if, you know, if, if our country is hurting, you know, we are hurting. And, uh, you know, Mother Nature, she's, you know, she's ingrained in us. And it's just something that, 
you know, we really need to, you know, back and reconnect. And maybe this is, you know, for our non-Indigenous allies, this is a part of your journey of truth telling, uh, you know, a part of those resources that you were trying to, you know, find and learn more about the truths and about the injustices and atrocities about First Nations around the world. Um, but, you know, super excited to get, you know, into it, um, you know, so yeah, um, bring, you know, fly those questions right at us. <laughs> Thanks, sis. Um, something that before we get into, I'm seeing a couple of questions come through. Um, and before we get into it, I think something I just wanted to briefly touch on with all of you, um, you know, Kwana, you touched on this, and I feel like others have as well, is that, you know, recently we've had a pretty heavy heart. We've seen a lot of big issues going on around the world and in our own communities. And um, you know, I guess one part of, of, of this is just checking in and hearing like, how are you? How are you going? You know, um, it's a lot to carry everything that we do. Um, but also we're in this moment where we, you know, a moment in, in history where we're on the, the um, oh, I always get my words mixed up, the brick of change, the brink of change. You know what I mean? We're on the tip of the, you know, tip of tipping point. Um, and we have, you know, in the last six months or six to nine months, we've seen huge ravaging bushfires or wildfires. Like we've we've seen that here in Australia. I know it's been happening, you know, throughout the Amazon and other parts, around, um, other places around the world. We then saw, you know, the conversation shifting from fires and the need for Indigenous land management to um, dealing with a global health pandemic. And then, you know, more recently, we've seen the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement and not only, you know, talking about Black Lives Matter, but here in this country, it's highlighted the, you know, deaths in custody and the violent treatment of our people that's been going on ever since colonization. And it's brought, I guess, these issues to the spotlight. It's not as if they haven't been going on. They have, we just, oh, you know, most people haven't been hearing about them. And so, you know, whether it's environmental racism or um, racism on the streets, like, you know, we, we hear it, we feel it. Um, and we're a part of creating the change. And so I wanted to just hear like, how are you going? And, you know, what does this m movement, oh, sorry, what does this um, moment in time mean for you? Um, because I think we, you know, there's, there's a real struggle, but there's also a sense of this is the time and this is our time to, you know, to act and to make a change. Um, anyone want to tune in and, and go first? Um, happy to just sort of throw the ball around. Judith? Ball count. <laughs> I caught the ball. Right? <laughs> um, sure. I mean, yeah, you know, you mentioning the bushfires and everything that's happening. Um, I just I just wanted to reflect a little bit on that, you know, and, and think about your you're right. I, I, I don't think that these issues ha are new. You know, I don't think that these uprisings even are new. I mean, if these uprisings weren't possible or people didn't take a stand and stand their ground, we wouldn't have civil rights. We wouldn't have um, the abolishment of slavery. We wouldn't have all of these things. Right. And I think that that just goes to show just how um, how powerful it is to have um, that that rage from people, the oppressed people, people of color, and the people that have just you know stood up and said that enough is enough, that we're going to do something, and how powerful these networks of solidarity are, and how important they are for us to continue to create these platforms for ourselves and speak for ourselves, you know, and, and, and take, take uh, the power back to our communities and, and create um, community-based systems where we are in charge and we are autonomous from um, governments and, and, you know, politicians that are only in their seats to continue to oppress us and uphold white supremacy and, and racist laws and policies. And, and I think that, you know, um, these natural disasters, you know, that's Mother Nature telling us that no matter what kind of governments that we create, she is far, she's still far more powerful and, and we can lose everything in a matter of minutes and seconds and, and you know, um, and I think that that's, 
that's very a, a very powerful thing to say, you know, for for us to continue to create our communities um, in a strong way, in an equitable way, um, in a sustainable way, uh, where we're communicating in a in, in all the ways that we need to to love each other, um, because love is the most powerful tool here. You know, the love for one another and and compassion for one another uh, to be able to protect ourselves and our families and our communities when these systems that were created to protect the system, you know, comes uh, crushing us down. Um, and and I just I just wanted to say that, you know, I wanted to remind us that um, that is it's powerful. People power is very powerful and we need to take it back. You know, the Black Lives Matter movement is not new. I think that, you know, it's it's a testament to what solidarity can truly look like you know when indigenous people communities of color get together and and see that the black lives matter movement isn't just about um black people but it's about all of us that are affected by these things you know and we are in solidarity with our our siblings out there that um that have been enslaved and, you know, kidnapped also and, and put in detention centers, you know, our trans siblings that are still, you know, trying to figure out a way to even continue to thrive and exist in this world and be acknowledged as the beautiful sacred beings that they are. And, you know, we need to, um, we need to acknowledge that we need to uh, see the intersections of all of these movements and how they're all connected and uphold them. And, and, you know, even those that are family members that can't really see what this is all about, you know, they, they, they need a little bit of patience, but also it's time, it's time to just like let go of these old ways, um, these racist, homophobic, transphobic ways that, you know, are not even serving our planet um, and, and continue to exploit and destroy the sources of life, you know, that we, that this planet has. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I saw a question that somebody asked, you know, what are the theories of change that, that we're all putting forth? And I think that we need to um, look at the legacies of the work that our elders have put in, you know, that the civil rights teaches us, um, women's rights, gender rights, and, and we need to unite all of those movements because we're not alone in this, you know, and, and I think it's time to to not be so biased, uh, you know, not one life matters over the other, but if the all lives matter movement truly cares that all lives matter, then they need to get their shit together. And I'm sorry, I just cussed, but <laughs> they really do, you know? Um, and, and yeah, I think that, you know, we're, we're um, carrying that torch. I'm carrying that torch. This is not new. I didn't come up with that. We didn't come up with that. You know, this has been written and we're just passing it on. You know, our ancestors um, taught us how to, how to stand our ground, how to like be empowered by, by our light and our spirit. So we're just continuing that and, and protecting each other right now because this administration in the U.S. is not it's not at all moving us forward um, and it's just getting in the way of, of true progress, I think, so. Thank you so much, sis, that, yeah, just resonates so much. Um, before we go to some of the other questions, do we want to throw that ball to any other panelists to speak to, yeah, what this moment in history um, means for you or thoughts, reflections, feelings you've had? I'm happy to go first. Um, you did, sis, as you were saying before, I feel like this time, this crazy time, was almost like a global eruption of the issues that happen in Indigenous people's lives on a daily matter. And it's just erupted on a global scale, scale for everyone to have to stop and look and notice these things. But I feel like as an Indigenous woman or someone who's you know, very connected to the earth and the land. These are issues that we face daily in all moments. The issues that we've had of systemic racism, of effects of colonialism, 
you know, health inequity, climate justice, land rights issues, um, Indigenous deaths in custody being highlighted again. None of this is new stuff, as you keep saying. So I feel like it was almost like an extreme energy shift of something that's felt quite inward in circles culturally to being something that Western countries need to highlight and, and deal with. And I understand the, the pressure of having to educate other people about these issues and it can be, you know, quite a lot on our mob. Um, but yeah, I guess like holding that space and recognising that, that this is not new, it's just been like an eruption of, of all of our brains and something that we deal with in every instance. So crazy times. And I guess our lack of cultural connection or lack of connection to this land is what's led us to where we are today. The fact that so many, I guess, Western cultures don't know their place and their connection with this land and who they are creates extreme dispossession and allows for these systems that we're that are built that don't recognize and nurture the land and and you know our mother earth in the way that she deserves and I guess from I guess my own perspective I feel like as indigenous people that we're getting pretty tired of having to defend our purpose constantly in this life of having to watch our people and the world burn under all these systems that were built to silence and oppress us and threaten our culture and threaten our livelihoods. And I guess I was speaking to someone the other day and I was just saying to them, like how many more of our mob have to die for these issues to keep continuing and cycling over and over and over again? Things have to start to change now. Um, how many more times can we rape and pillage our country with dirty fossil fuels and unsustainable growth? How many more sacred sites have to be blown up by these massive companies that don't care about us or our sense of purpose and what we're doing? Um, how many times will you dispossess us of our rights and try and move our mob off of our own land and try and manage our country in ways that you don't actually understand how to do? Um, yeah, the lack of respect and recognition in these areas is just absolutely crazy. And I think this platform of being able to come together and, and yarn about this and talk about the global linearity and really come together in allyship and ask for white allyship is incredibly important. So yeah, absolutely crazy times. I guess I've seen a couple of questions in there about, um, I guess, where to from here. And it's about finding your own sense of connection and connection to this land and uniting together to better the state of this world, protect our, our mother earth and begin to transform, I guess, thinking locally, but acting globally in ways of doing your part in utilizing sustainable solutions to power our urbanized and industrialized ways of life. We know that a green future is possible. We used to live completely green only 240 years ago on this country. Um, and we lived in harmony with the land and we know how to nurture and look after and have everything in balance. And I do truly believe that despite population growth and the way that we've created these systems and where we are at now with the evolution of humanity, we're able to live green again and find better ways with the knowledges that we have with the intersection of different races and cultures and communities and languages and different knowledges coming together, we can create a future that is more just and sustainable than ever, where we can nurture everyone the way that we deserve and really ensure that we uplift um, everyone to be on the same platform, to be nurtured and looked after properly where we live in harmony with our land again. Thanks, Tiani. Um, Kwana or Tish, did you want to comment on that at all? I think they hit it out the ballpark. There's nothing more to add to that. That's just simple facts. That's how it is. Um, I just want to say that I completely agree. This is all, you know, everything that's happening right now is kind of of a reflection on like how our country has thinks like, you know, with all of Trump's support you think wow it opens your eyes to think wow a lot of our people genuinely don't care and with these movements going on you know a lot of our people well a lot of people of color indigenous people I have been trying to get this message out there for time and time again like 
you know, how many people have to die? How many, you know, like um, you guys were saying, you know, it's, it's time for change. And, you know, being a young person, I always have, um, you know, a lot of people trying to come at me saying that I'm young, I'm not educated enough, or, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about, but not only am I educated, I have my own experiences. And I have seen what this world is capable of. Um, and I'm not gonna back down. And, you know, that's a strong message to everybody is, you know, the more we fight, the more change comes and the more people open their eyes. And, you know, with everything that's going on and, you know, a lot of people are now having to have these awkward, tough conversations with even family members maybe that may be, you know, racist or whatever. It's, it's really hard right now. It's a struggle for a lot of people because it's really eye-opening and it's putting people out of their comfort zones. So um, my heart goes out to everyone who has to deal with those situations. And also my heart goes out to everyone that has their um, experiences with how this world is. And um, yeah, I think all is said and all is, that's all I need to say. <laughs> Thanks so much, sis. Um, so we've just had a question come through on Facebook um, from Carla, um, a non-Indigenous person who um, has been doing a lot of um, educating themselves about what's going on. And um, their question is, are there any authors, writers or activists that you recommend looking into? And I think if I could paraphrase that a little bit in, in one way that I think about it as well as like, who are the people that you look up to or, you know, that have inspired you um, that our listeners and audience out there um, should look into, or maybe they might be someone personal to you, but yeah, who are those people um, or are there any yeah, writers or authors or people that you want to recommend others looking into? Anyone want to have a go? <laughs> sure, I'll go. Um, I mean, there's, there's so many people that I look up to. Um, there's, if you actually follow the, the film, you'll get to meet a lot of people who support the film, but then also made an appearance on the film, like Casey Camp Hornet, who um, Brian visited in, in the Ponca tribe nation, who's the, also the speaker in the film, who is an amazing organizer, an amazing elder um, that uh, was also an actress in, in her younger years, but um, is a beautiful, eloquent speaker who talks a lot about the prophecies and, and she has a lot to, to teach. And that's somebody I look up to. There's um, also organizations like Los Jardines Institute in New Mexico who do a lot of land-based work who uh, pretty much taught me about organizing, bottom-up organizing, and you know taught me about the Hemis principles and the the um, people of color principles for democracy and and so many others. Um, Richard Moore, who's also um, the co-director of Los Jardines and his wife, uh, Sophia, um, who is also an amazing elder. Um, I, I can I can just think of, of of some. I think that if you follow the film, you get a lot more amazing people that I, I don't want to leave anyone out. Um, but those are some that come to mind because it it it's who brought me up in in movement work and um, it's also very dear to my heart. But there's my grandma, who you don't know, but she also, you know, was one of the people who uh, was also featured in the film, but then uh, was always uh, taking interviews from the news because she's from that community and she spoke a lot about the issues and she's somebody who didn't go to school longer than like first grade and barely knows how to write and read, but she is an amazing warrior and smart as hell and taught me everything I know about building community and building family. So, you know, that's someone who is not an author, but is definitely someone who's a big influence on my life um, that I can share and I feel proud to share. That's deadly. Who else? <laughs> <laughs> 
I, you know, I actually want to, oh, sorry, Kwana, just quickly. <laughs> no, I think it's actually a really great reflection and really, um, you know, as we're here, because, you know, it's, you know, looking at, you know, the people that have uh, been before us um, and really sort of led these movements it, uh, is, yeah, I guess that long list, like you said, Judith. Um, and, you know, in, in, for me, you know, coming from a seed background, uh, you know, we've had some incredible people within seed, uh, you know, prior to me who have always sort of led and really started this movement. And especially here in Australia, there's so many and the list, you know, actually does go a uh, lot so long um but you know like you know Karina Noll from like original power Millie yourself you know I really have you know looked up to you in just in the way you've just shared the way we you know look after and see country um you know Larissa Baldwin who you know started this with you um in seed and yeah we've got you know some amazing uh better lack for word activists, you know, out there in, in communities that are really on about, you know, um, Aboriginal resistance and land rights and, you know, coming from staunch, like generations of backgrounds. But, you know, it all comes, hey, down to your inner circle and, you know, who, you know, how you were raised and it does come back from the strong women leading our families, like our mothers, you know, our ummers, our uckers, you know, where would we be without their hard work, their perseverance, and so, you know, I do shout out to my mums, um, my mum and her sister who, you know, raised me, supported me, taught me the ways, taught me wrong from right, but taught me to always love and care. And so, um, yeah, just to add to that, those amazing people. So that's great. To you, Kwana. Um, definitely, I agree. Definitely the older generations, my elders, um, I was always taught to whenever an elder is speaking is just to listen. And I think that's where I learned a lot is listening and watching my mom, my aunties, I call them my auntie squad. <laughs> um, pretty much all of the strong and really incredible women in my life. Um, for one, my mom, she has been literally everything I can think of, a dog musher, firefighter, police officer, um, everything. She has snowboard instructor. I can name off a lot of different things, but, you know, her always sharing with me her experiences, people she meet from all walks of life, um, and just really listening to her and how she has um, always been a part of a movement. Ever since she was young, she has always fought for, you know, all people, and um, I think really growing up and seeing that and then also um, really listening in on my mom and my auntie's conversations when they're talking about, you know, politics or what's even happening within my Native people um, and our Indigenous communities, just really educating myself that way by listening to my elders and my powerful women in my life. Um, that's what I really... I think where I learned the most is just also um, looking up to um, a lot of our beautiful Native women that have really, and I mean, all one women, just, you know, going through what they had to go through to be here. Um, especially, I like to think of, you know, my grandma, obviously you guys don't know her, but she, um, she has definitely been through a lot and she still tells me and gets emotional about the days when she was a kid and she had to be taken from her home and her family. And um, so just, you know, hearing her experiences makes me want to fight even harder for our future generations, for our basic human rights, to be able to live our late ways of life without having to worry about what threatens it. Um, just, you know, especially with everything that's going on nowadays this whole year of 2020 it's one thing after another and it's you know becoming more and more for us um and it feels like you know more weight is crashing down on us but the more we communicate with other people the more we talk about these issues and the more 
we um, connect with people, the more we grow and the more we start thriving and the more we start to heal. And I think, um, you know, with, you know, young activists, I've met a lot of incredible people and um, just really looking up to them and thinking, wow, like, I'm not alone in these fights because, you know, um, all, all of our older people that have been activists <laughs> since before my time, um, we are simply called activists because we are going out of our way, you know, to fight for our basic human rights. And um, I really, you know, for me, one is definitely Dallas Goldtooth, my auntie princess. She is a producer and um, I think executive director of um, this new show, show called Molly of Denali. I think um, if, I don't know if any of you have heard of it, but it's a little, it's kind of like a show like Dora, but um, an Alaska native version. So it's a little native girl from Alaska living her ways of life. It's just kind of um, the first show really introducing, um, you know, natives up here in Alaska. And I've had a lot of young girls come up to me and ask me if I knew princess and, you know, telling me like, um, how much that show is like really showing a lot of younger kids like wow there's a lot more to the world out there not just you know what I have in front of me and just being able to um, see how much our people are growing and um, yeah that's pretty much who I look up to is just all of these beautiful women um, being able to come together and um, uplift each other with our platforms and just using our voices together. That's so awesome. I'm gonna have to keep an eye out for that um, that film because yeah, like having our children see themselves on the screen, you know, is just like, it, it goes back to what we were saying around us taking that power back and knowing how amazing we are um, and knowing that just existing is a form of resistance in itself. Um, I think before we move on to the next question, one thought that I just had on that question of like, you know, I guess ultimately it was asking, you know, how do we, how do you educate yourself? Um, and, you know, what, who were some of the people out there? Um, one thing that I just looked up, some people in Australia might be familiar with um, Bo Spiram. Um, he's on Murray Radio up in Queensland. He's just um, started a podcast called Frontier War Stories. And I just checked, you can actually tune into it on Spotify, um, but it's on other platforms as well. And, you know, each week he gets different speakers, different First Nation speakers to come on. And so, you know, just that tool in itself, um, I think is incredibly powerful to, to learn more and to just hear these stories. Um, our next question has come in um, from Shan. What is the best way, and because I saw this question pop up from a few other people as well, what is the best way to be an ally without taking over the voice of Indigenous people? Um, so I guess that's for non-Indigenous people, maybe other people of colour even, um, but how to be an ally to Indigenous people. Um, Tiani, maybe I'll throw to you, sis. Um, because uh, I didn't get you to answer that last one. <laughs> Am I off mute? Amazing. Um, allyship comes in so many different forms and I know that it's something that I've been finding it um, kind of difficult to explain because we say like be an ally and you know stand beside us and help elevate our voices but I know that it's far more complicated than that. And I know that, um, and I really appreciate too, that people are making strong attempts to be sensitive and do things in the right way now. Um, that's extremely valued. So the questions about this um, are just fantastic. So thanks so much for that. I think a big part of allyship is Dadiri, which is deep inner listening and stillness and really taking information from our indigenous leaders and our mob um, and really listening to that in its full enormity, taking time, stepping back and allowing First Nations voices to be there. There's so many ways that you can show allyship, simple ones that we have. Um, I guess anything that you're organising is ensuring that you have 
First Nations permission and First Nations perspective in that and not as a tokenistic thing, but understanding the value and why that needs to be done. Because when you understand the value of allyship and of First Nations perspective and voices, then it will never be tokenistic. So, so many things are done for us, not by us and not led by us. And that's more hurtful than not doing it at all sometimes, um, especially, you know, in things where, I mean, there's, there's paths of protests and things being run for our mob without actually talking to traditional owners of the land that these protests are happening on. And we really need to be leaders in this. So it's about, I guess, networking and finding those networks and creating those connections. Um, there's so many books. I might actually chuck a link in the chat on Zoom um, about some resources of First Nations leaders and I guess developing sovereignty between us on Australian soil. Um, Kwana and Judith, if you maybe have any resources of books that people can read up um, on your own soil, we can just chuck them in there. There's so many documentaries and films and books and things that go into great depth and lengths on how to be a good ally. And so I'll just put some links in here now while I throw the ball off to whoever wants to catch it. It's up in the air right now. <laughs> yeah, I'll just mention, um, I did mention the Hemis principles, which uh, were founded um, in the first People of Colour conference where there are principles on allyship, you know, on, on how to be a good ally uh, to people of colour and how to uh, step up and step back, um, you know, and let people speak for themselves, how to, um, you know, like you said, not be a, a tokenizing tool, but um, to, to actually be uh, in support and in solidarity with people of color, indigenous people, and not not impose your own ideas um, into things that you know are are not about you. Um, and 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 also earlier at our earlier discussion, you know, Brian said something really powerful, which was, you know, sometimes you have to sit in that discomfort of uh, talking about racism and talking about race. And that needs to happen in a lot of our circles um, within our own organizations and collectives of people, you know, uh, some people aren't ready for that conversation and even take offense when people talk about race, but that needs to happen and true allyship, you know, sometimes you have to sit in that discomfort um, and conflict doesn't need to be a way to separate and segregate people. It can be a way to heal through things because uh, people of color, indigenous people, black people have a lot of hurt, um, a lot of trauma, a lot of a lot of that still sits in our DNA and we carry it through, you know, so that that anger that we feel and that hurt that we feel, um, you know, comes from uh comes from generations of that trauma and we need to make space for it. And a true ally knows how to sit in it, you know, and, and kind of take it a little bit, but then also dig deep into their spirit um, and heal alongside us, you know, not just take offense and get defensive. Um, and that's the, that's the true challenge, honestly, you know, when you want to be, uh, you want to be an ally you don't call yourself an ally and you say i'm here to be an ally you get invited to to be an ally right and and so that's also another conversation you know um and that's what I, i'll look for those links i i know i have them somewhere and i'll share that so people can look at that and and you know just kind of reflect on them um you know Tisha or Kwana, did you want to add to that? Perfect. I don't, I have nothing else to say. <laughs> that was spot on. Awesome. Um, so we are going to be coming to a close and starting to, um, I guess, wrap things up. Um, 
I wanted to finish on a note and bear with me. There's a few questions in one here, but I wanted to ask like, you know, what keeps your fire burning? Like what keeps you going and what gives you hope? Um, and, you know, I guess the, the next part of that then is what do you ask of all the people who are tuning in here? Because we've got, I don't know what the numbers are, um, but I think there's probably around 100 people between the Zoom and Facebook. And, you know, people have come here um, giving up their Saturday, I guess, to listen in and some mob, some, you know, some non-Indigenous people as well. Um, what, yeah, like what keeps your fire burning and gives you hope and what do you ask of everyone that's tuning in? Um, what's your call to action? Um, again, balls in the air, whoever's ready to catch it. <laughs> But I got it. <laughs> no, um, what a great question. I guess, um, you know, uh, I'm really, I'm looking at what's happened this year in 2020. This is what keeps me motivated and really keeps that fire burning. Especially here in Australia, we had a devastating summer. And in the same week that our last fire was burning, our isolation and social distancing took place in the same week. And, you know, what I really saw through that time of that bushfire was the amount of people across the world that really came together to support Australians through, you know, the, um, you know, the flora and fauna care, you know, through us here at SEED um, and, you know, really supporting those organisations that are actually on the front lines of, you know, climate justice. And like, you know, we've been saying, it's these fossil fuel industries that are ex exacerbating our climate and, you know, we just can't control it anymore. And each year as we keep going further on, you know, they are, you know, more devastating to, you know, our remote communities and we are the ones that are most you know and worst impacted you know this will not happen you know this will not happen though without you know a massive mobilization of people everywhere you know the effort thus far has fallen short of overcoming the persistent refusal by these powerful elite corporations and governments to meet their responsibilities and obligations and their efforts to stand in the way of social change platforms like this having our voices elevated is where is where it's going to happen and we have to do it like i said you know we have to be the ones leading it not be a part of it leading it and we've seen through the last month of like how an international like everyone across the world came together for black lives matter that it's just that's what we need we need we need people to step up lean in and listen now and we have to do this together because that's how we're going to create that social change and you know we are not just fighting for transformation of these energy systems but you know making long-term and sustainable solutions for our people for our young mob we want you know sustainable food systems for our communities you know to decrease those carcinogenic health risks you know that are introduced by again those white big corporations and capitalists and so you know that's you know that's where i want to see and you know for call to action you know here we are just speaking up listen listen to us you know there's like sissy tiani said there are so many different ways that you can but you know firstly you know educate yourself jump on and seed if you're here in australia and you know uh you know pledge to our campaigns that we are doing and you know what we're fighting for in the nt you know we have our nt elections coming up in august and it's just so important that every vote counts and we want to encourage that for our mob and our people about how important that is um you know donations you know always help because that allows us to go into those communities and like you did said you have to sort of be invited into the them. and so and it takes that you know relationships a uh, relationship building and so you know that's what that goes towards and so I mean I can just really go on but you know I'm going to quickly pass it on because we do have a few minutes left sorry Sissy. Kwana you want to go next? Um, for me um, I don't know I mean I do know but I'm let me put it together better. Um, I guess, you know, being here and listening to everything and taking in what everyone has said, um, I just, you know, like, again, a thank you for, you know, being here, elevating my voice, but also I'm learning from you. Um, and, you know, as 
I'm learning more and more about, you know, you know, what's happening in your part of the world. Um, I find more and more connections from where I'm at. And, you know, with all these fires, we're getting fires here too. And um, our fish camp where we traditionally go on our land um, to live our way of life, we had to go there and there were firefighters camping at our site because they're protecting our land from getting literally burnt down. We were surrounded by fire. There's fires everywhere. So we feel your devastation. We feel that. Um, and I just right now, um, I guess in these last few months with everything that's going on, I've just been having a heavy heart, um, a lot of trauma and a lot of these difficult conversations are being brought up. A lot of people are either putting up a wall or they're op they're starting to open up their mind more to, you know, different perspectives and stuff. And for anybody that wants to really, um, you know, do more, or feel like they can learn more, or feel like they can somehow, um, you know, just add to the fire you know what feeds my fire is learning from other people and meeting other people but also connecting and um just th thinking about the future the generations to come and the young people who are rising right now we are tired and we are angry because of the you know we're seeing how much our world and our people are being mistreated and, you know, um, as someone, you know, that just, that is just now an adult, um, I'm still pretty young. Um, you know, I do, you know, have to deal with a lot of younger people telling me, um, you know, are just more uneducated because in the school systems and our curriculums, they don't teach um, the history the right way at all. And so it's me constantly going out of my way to educate people. So please, if you need, educate yourselves. That's one thing. It's really exhausting for us to continuously, continuously repeat ourselves on educating people. Just educate yourselves. It's there, there's resources. And even if you're confused, it's okay to reach out too. Like, First step is educating yourself and then reaching out to those to learn more. And I think that's what we're missing a lot is a lot of people go straight to attacking you to not, you know, getting defensive, not trying to understand. So for me, it's like, stay open minded and um, just listen and be mindful of what you say and who's around you because, you know, um, there's a lot of trauma right now not just with um, people, but within the earth and within the air even. I feel it, I feel the tension everywhere I go. Um, everyone's on edge with everything that's been going on. So um, it's just what feeds my fire is um, just everyone and how the communities are coming together and um, being a part of that and just seeing and hearing young people wanting to learn more. And it pushes me further and further um, in my path and it keeps me woke. <laughs> and um, I just encourage a lot of other people to try and stay woke as well. <laughs> Thanks, sis. Um, Tiani, and then we'll go to you, Judith, for closing remarks. Sure, so I think I just wanna highlight um, finding strength in these times of injustice and being able to strengthen through times of injustice and how important that is. And shout out to all you sissies online right now that I'm on the panel with, as well as everyone, um, regardless of nationality, gender role, you're all incredible. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for being a part of the change. I think it's really important that we lean on the strength of our ancestors um, no matter what side of our family they're from, to acknowledge our place and time here and now and our presence in where we're at and to really acknowledge the long lineage of strength that has brought us to where we are right now. And 
being able to, I guess, utilise the media perspective of jumping on, I guess, I'll, I guess the highlight of climate justice and the things that are awkward and hard to talk about in regards to racism and injustice for our mob. Let's continue to gather together and unite in these times of injustice. I think strength for me comes a lot from spending time back out in nature, making sure that I'm rooted and connected to my place, understanding and knowing what I'm fighting for and why keeps the fire burning and just ensuring that you do, you do take your own time to you know, go and connect in with the land yourself. I think we can get caught up trying to do and do and do and, and be heard and um, amplify and get things done and go, go, go. And it's so important for us to also take time to go and sit by a body of water and just connect in with ourselves and connect in with the land and our ancestors and where we're at. So in terms of moving forward, um, allyship, educate yourselves, spread love, um, continue to fight the good fight and, yeah, I guess gather these resources and make the most of the information that's available to you. Understand that in large bodies of water and waterfalls that they consist of tiny little individual droplets to make these massive changes that can, you know, push and destroy and change land or feed and resource um, other individuals and animals. So be a drop of water, unite us in this fight, be part of our big body of water of change for global change and justice. And yeah, join along, keep educating yourselves. There is so much to be done, but we have so much potential to do it now. So thanks so much for listening. Big love. Thanks, sis. Over to you, Eudis. Thanks, thanks so much. I'm losing steam not because of y'all's energy y'all are feeding my fire it's just getting late here um but i you know i think for me i constantly have to you know stop like you said sometimes we're constantly on the go and trying to like do all these things and um i have this really deep sense of duty sometimes Times, which comes from my grandmother uh, and, and I have a hard time shutting it off. So sometimes I have to sit by the water and this beautiful picture behind me is a forest that I stumbled upon um, earlier this week. Actually, it was like yesterday. <laughs> and I found this um, this mission, this this belonged to indigenous people. And at one point, this was where they came to, to, to do different trades. Um, and it was just a beautiful forest that I got to sit in for a while and, and reflect and, you know, really um, ground myself and, and why I'm here. And I constantly have these existential questions, you know, and, and affirming myself and, and, you know, trying to push myself to continue because this is hard. And um, a lot of this, these things that we've witnessed, you know, they, they stay with you and they, they stay kind of heavy and, it's a lot of work to try to heal through it and try to stay strong. But I think that what really keeps me strong is remembering all of the women, all of my grandmothers um, that that had to stay strong for their family. You know, we've come a long way um, and, and my family is, is strong because of them and they've always been our pillars. And I try to hold on to that power of the matriarchy, you know, that kept us going and kept us strong and wise and, and just also gentle throughout that because I, let me tell you, I come from a long line of hard hearted women um, and we have a hard time being sweet <laughs> to each other, but it's because we have to be strong, you know, and we have to remember that we have responsibility of family, um, and we're migrant people, so we have to, we have to stay focused and, and strong always. We can't lose our fire. Um, so I remember that, and I, I keep them close. And also, you know, that, that through me, that these women that were oppressed and suppressed are healing through me. You know, I'm a very free spirit, and I, I like to think that all of the women in my my ancestor line, lineage, you know, are healing through me and that I, I also carry this duty to heal, uh, but also stay strong and, and help 
you know, our mother earth stay strong. Um, and, and that's what keeps me going. Um, because sometimes it's very hard, um, to see the, the light at the end of the darkness. Um, but you know, that's, that's what's going to keep us going too. And I hope that also you all, you young women that are doing this work and also learning also feel my fire and keep me inspired and keep me on my toes, you know, because when I lose energy, I have to remember that um, I'm also being looked at, you know, in a different light and that y'all are saying I'm amazing. And um, even though it feels really good and warm in my heart, it also, you know, keeps me on my toes and keeps me going. So I appreciate y'all. I appreciate your power and your beauty and all of the things that y'all are learning and doing for your people um, all over the world. So thank you so much for having us and uh, making space for this film. Wow. Well, it's been so special. Um, thank you all so much for tuning in um, and being on the panel. Thanks to everyone who's been listening to this conversation. Um, I feel like this is, um, you know, in some ways, just the start of a connection that we've now built with one another. And I'm excited to see what, where that takes us into the future, um, but know that we're always with you um, and we have each other. And I think that's what keeps me going. So thank you so much for everyone who's tuned in. We did go a couple minutes over. I apologize for that. Um, as you know, as we've said, there's so much that can be done. Um, please, you know, um, check out the different, um, I guess, websites and, and channels that have been shared on our seed page. Um, we'll share these links again. Um, and I think we'll specifically, if it's okay with you, Judith and Kwana, we'll do a shout out to you both in the work that you're doing and how we can support you mob. Um, and then for everyone here, um, if you want to support Seed more, as Tish mentioned, go to nt.seedmob.org.au slash pledge um, to, to join our campaign supporting Aboriginal communities in the Northern Territory fighting gas fracking. Because no matter where you are, there's something that you can do to take action, um, especially on that campaign. So thank you all so much. Love you all so much. You're amazing. Take care of yourself. Go enjoy your day or enjoy your sleep. Um, yeah, thank you again and we'll see you soon. <laughs> Bye. Love you, Bye.